Okay, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Ciccinelli, and uh, I'm quite pleased to present today on the osteofiber, a, a new biointegrative implant fixation category, specifically at this point for hammer toe surgery. Uh, I currently practice in Vigo, Spain. I'm a, a surgeon consultant. Uh, I work around Europe and the Middle East and uh, still consult uh, in North America. And I'm still active, uh, actively practicing and sur doing surgery and teaching and so forth. So it's always a pleasure for me to be involved with innovations and uh, presenting new material. And this is very exciting. I, uh, my background with this specific product is I'm one of the co-principal investigators of the first in human use clinical trial in Europe between myself and Dr. Yuri Stalk uh, from Slovenia. So we all know certainly that uh, metal fixation, be it stainless steel or titanium, certainly works uh, very, very well. Uh, and this is an alternative to that. And it's not that uh, metal fixation uh, isn't good. We all use it and we all have good results, but it certainly creates a suboptimal healing environment and creates possibilities of, as you see in these slides here, uh, breaking of implants such as in syndesmotic screws, possibilities of infections due to the adherence of glycocalyxes and bioslime layers to fixation, sometimes still percutaneous fixation, cystic changes, sometimes needs for removal, secondary procedures. And I think really the question is about why is there a suboptimal healing environment? And when we ask why is that, I think the direct answer to that is, is that even though metal, titanium, stainless steel, steel have been the standard of care for years and years, they still, in two words, are foreign bodies. They're foreign bodies to the body uh, compared to bone healing and the biology of bone healing. And so the, the question really uh, persists, and that is, is, is there not a more optimal or better type of fixation device? And the desire to replace metal is certainly not new. If we look through the kind of historical timeline here from back in the 18th century to present, certainly we can see the development of plates and screws in the mid 1800s, the first absorbable screw, bioabsorbable made out of polymers, in this case, poly L lactic acid, 1995, onto peak type implants in the 90s, biocomposites, which were basically blends of poly L lactic acid, poly D lactic acid, on to really 2019, which I think is the exciting, most recent generation, the most up-to-date implant available in what we're calling biointegrative implants. When we look at really what these materials are offering, we can start with this graph here where you see on the x-axis natural bone regeneration and on the y-axis strength, okay? And so what Osteo has come up with is the combination of the material components of the product of the implant with its internal architecture, which is creating the perfect blend of strength and biofriendliness. I call it a better marriage or better harmony between the implant and the bone. But biointegratives, osteofiber, for example, is really, if you look over here, the ideal implant because what does it do? It has metal like insertion upon on strength, metal like insertion strength. So as you're putting it in, you have that same feel. It also allows basically sufficient fixation during the healing process and allows a controlled degradation as the bone heals and the implant integrates into the bone. So you have the perfect balance. You have the bone healing, the implant holding it together, the implant starting to degrade and go away in a controlled fashion while the bone heals. And then what's the goal? Okay, what's nirvana here? The nirvana is the body forgets about the implant because the implant's no longer necessary and it leaves nothing behind. If we look more closely at osteofiber and their intelligent bone regeneration technology, it's a, a slide we, which we need to look at carefully. And let's just start off with the materials, okay? First of all, the materials in it already have been used and already have existed in previous implants. And so safety, efficacy, lack of of adverse events, cytotoxicity, reactions, allergic reactions, immunoresponses, all that is a non-concern because these materials have already been used in other implants, such as bone graft substitutes, osteoconductive materials. And so the component is a 50-50 mixture of natural mineral fibers and poly-LDL 
acid, okay? So that's polylactic D and L. The natural mineral fibers are a blend of thousands and thousands and thousands of fibers that naturally occur in bone, silica, magnesium, phosphorus, calcium. And if you look at the implant here, the surface texture of the, of the very implant itself enables early bone attachment, which when you then go to a scanning electron microscopy of the material, you can see that essentially what we have between this picture and this picture is we have layer and layer and layer of this natural fiber or natural mineral fiber matrix suspended in the polymer. The architecture and the absorption characteristics that allow for the bio-integration of the implants has been completely calculated and studied. This entire architecture of the blend of the natural mineral fiber matrix with the polymer can be manipulated or altered for specific situations of where we might want to resist different forces versus other. For example, if we think in a kind of osteosynthesis sense or a uh, internal fixation sense, we know that what we're trying to do is we're trying to resist certain forces. So forces such as bending, torsion, and shear, and then perhaps specifically in, in weight bearing and, and foot and ankle surgery, forces of compression and, and tensile forces, and even pull out forces. So we have the ability now with this technology, this, this intelligent bone regeneration technology, we have the ability to modify the architecture and the the fabrication of these implants to resist certain forces. So in conclusion regarding the ability to manipulate the architecture of a screw or an implant or a, or a rod or a pin or a nail, uh, think for example of a metal screw or a titanium screw. The, the ability to resist forces is basically homogenous throughout the implant, okay, because it's all basically one element. Here, the internal architecture can be modified to resist certain forces more than others, depending on specific needs. If we then look at how this, uh, these implants actually integrate or biointegrate, it's a hybrid integration, integration process, which is really, really, really fascinating, scientific, and chemically balanced. And so if we look at the slide here, polymer component is being broken down in in conjunction or in concert or in harmony, the mineral components are starting to integrate. And it's very balanced and favorable and creates a very favorable environment for bone healing. Why? Because it's pH balanced. If we look at the preclinical studies, the two-year animal study, this was an osteofiber pin compared to a commercially available pin by Inion. And if we look at the graph here, on the, on the, on the x-axis, we have in-bone implantation in a lateral femoral condyle of a rabbit. And here's the percent of polymer remaining, okay, over time, up to 104 weeks, which is two years. And we see that conventional bioresorbals have, at over a year, 78 weeks, still have 80% of their polymer remaining. And then they have sort of this more severely or abruptly declines and can create this burst effect. And this is where those delayed inflammatory reactions or incomplete reabsorption of these implants where you've had a hammer toe surgery where a pin is backed out or a chevron bunionectomy where a pin did not completely resorb or a screw head has then become an inflammatory nidus uh, even a year two years or three years later that's because this polymer the the screw was made out of just completely polymer no other substances there's a percentage of that that can still remain and creates this burst effect in contrast, if we look at the osteofiber technology, this fully integrates and goes away completely. And at two years, 104 weeks, there's no implant remaining. And again, to repeat, because it's so important, with no adverse inflammatory cells adjacently. And then if we just look at the slope of the graph, we see that we started off with only 50% polymer anyway, versus conventional absorbable implants that were 100%. So already we're 50%, and now as this absorbs and bone is getting stronger, and as this integrates, okay, it's virtually eliminated here at 78 weeks, but then gone at 104. So this very, very, very natural, gradual process of going away completely by two years after surgery with no adverse inflammation is really, really, really tremendous. If we look at the osteofiber uh, implant 
pins, for example, and their strength comparison with bone, it's 1.5% 1.5 times, excuse me, not percent, 1.5 times stronger than cortical bone at implantation. If we look at the graph here again, weeks post-surgery on the x-axis axis strength or elastic modulus, another word would be stiffness or rigidity, perhaps in a little more layman's language. Here at implantation, we have healthy cortical bone and we have the osteo fiber uh, implant up here, 1.5 times stronger right away versus peak, which is right here, which is a little bit weaker than healthy cortical bone upon implantation. Conventional bioresorbables, okay, weaker as well. And then if we look at the weeks post surgery, we see healing bone gradually starts to integrate the implant, starts to load share, reducing stress shielding, starting to accept more normal physiological load. The implant is providing that strength for the fixation during this phase and as it gradually osseo integrates and goes away and the bone gets stronger we have this really this perfect marriage between the implant we're asking to help heal the bone be it for an elective osteotomy a fusion a fracture fixation whatever the indication may be to help that bone heal and get back to a normal more physiological pre-injury state. Okay, so here's 13 weeks after surgery. We see with the comparison pin, okay, which was a pure bioproduct, okay, a pure copolymer. Here's the implant and here's cortical bone. No observed integration at 13 weeks. At 13 weeks with the biointegrative technology of osteofiber, we already see early bone attachment and ingrowth, clearly contrasting the two there at 13 weeks. If we go on to 26 to 52 weeks, we see a fibrotic encapsulation of the implant here with a pure copolymer, okay? All absorbable, all resorbable, versus the 50-50 mixture of osteofiber here. And we see pronounced new bone and tissue ingrowth within the implant. For me, this slide is the most fascinating of all. At 78 weeks, we can clearly see here in kind of a cross section. Here's the implant, here's the bone, and you can see there's some crack propagation, the implant, perhaps is reducing a molecular weight. It's starting to hydrolyze, but its general architecture is still intact. There's not a real good balance between bony ingrowth and the implant. And yet if we contrast that with the 50-50 mixture of osteofiber biointegrative technology, what we see here, look at this, complete bone formed around remodeled cortical bone completely as contrasted with the comparison implant. And uh, the histology is just wonderful. Histology doesn't really lie. You, you see what you see, and that's what it is. And then if we look at 104 weeks, two years post-implantation, we see here with bio-integrative osteofiber technology that we have only nature remaining. The pin is completely gone. We have bone back to its normal pre-injury state, whereas we have this delayed burst effect with the, the pure copolymer implant which is again, if we went back to that earlier slide, it's that last 10 to 15% of implant, which perhaps has never completely gone away. Looking through the literature uh, for myself, it's interesting to see, because I've been interested and been using absorbables for so long, 25 years now, since 1994, it's interesting to see that there's even some, a couple papers out there that, that talk about poly L lactic acid uh, still being present. Uh, between four to seven years even after implantation on some long-term uh, follow-up MRI studies versus again here only nature remaining at two years after surgery and I'm going to repeat one more time up here without adverse inflammation no adjacent inflammatory cells product available in the United States now is the medium size 2.9 millimeter in length I'm sorry in diameter by 19 millimeter length straight zero degree hammer toe fixation system. So hammer toe PIP joint fusion. A 10 degree uh, flexion is coming. The other sizes are coming as well. It comes with its own implant inserter, K wires, drill bits, a peel pack, okay? The, the design of the implant is very important and helpful. It has opposing barbs and a hexagonal shape. So that maintains alignment, allows uh, compression, allows or prevents distraction because of that compression and also provides rotational stability. Certainly, these types of implants are, are MRI safe and they don't impede imaging as some metallic implants uh, uh, can, as, can and we all know that. 
and the ability to drill or cut through them in the case that in case that need were to arise is certainly doable just as it, as with previous generations of bioresorbable technology. If we look at the actual surgical technique for a PIP fusion, the joint preparation and the dissection is really surgeon preference and, and everyone uh, using these implants will be seasoned surgeons or leaving residencies and fellowships and so forth. So the technique is, is your preferred approach uh, to, to hammer toe surgery. In the clinical trial, I performed all of these through a longitudinal, dorsal longitudinal incision, joint preparation, removing the cartilage and uh, uh, exposing the subchondral bone, removing subchondral bones, they have exposed cancellous bone at the head of the proximal phalanx, as well as the base of the middle phalanx, and then drilling the pilot hole into the proximal phalanx. The, it's really important here to stay and confirm whether you need to with floor or just visually, but kind of 360 degrees to be sure you're perfectly parallel to the dorsal cortex and you're not angled immediately or laterally and that you're straight down the pike, okay? The same into the middle phalanx, the pilot hole creation with the K-wire that comes in the kit, then the tunnel creation with the drill bit that comes in the kit as well. And then onto implant insertion. The implant can be pushed in uh, in about half the patients in the clinical trial. We just had to tamp it in gently, which I actually consider to be a plus because it really shows you how snug a fit we're getting in the proximal phalanx uh, with the implant insertion. And then the reduction of the middle phalanx over and onto the implant that's extending out of the proximal phalanx. A little tip and quip here and pearl is that in the majority of the cases, I did do a, a very careful release of the plantar plate insertion at the interphalangeal joint. So really it's the proximal interphalangeal joint plantar plate. A little release of that from the base of the middle phalanx. Of course, being careful not to go too deep and cut the long flexor tendon, but that allows just a little more uh, laxity, a little more distraction of the PIP joint as you distract the middle phalanx and then place it over the tip of the implant that's already in the proximal phalanx. Another little tip I like to always say about this type of technology is patient psychology. I can honestly tell you that over 25 years of using the different generations of these implants right up to the clinical trial uh, with osteofiber PIP joint implant, that there's no patient ever, not a single one, that when I've offered them the option of metallic fixation or permanent fixation or fixation that might need to be removed, be it a K-wire coming out the tip of a toe or a screw versus an absorpt absorption type technology, in this case, biointegrative, previously resorbable screws, absorbable screws, no patient has ever said, I'd like to have the metal or I'd like to have a pin stick it out of my toe. Patients intuitively get the advantage of this type of technology. And around the world, interestingly, surgeons do as well. It's, 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 it's curious to me that in North America, the United States in particular, surgeons have been what I would consider historically slow to embrace this type of technology. But around the world, uh, everyone seems to get it just more intuitively. And certainly in the United States, uh, this type of technology is embraced with anchors and soft tissue attachments and ligament repairs and so forth. But for some reason, uh, I think in, in general, we've been slow to embrace it uh, within internal fixation devices such as pins and screws compared to the, the, the great variety of metal options. But patients get it. Patients absolutely get it. And really, they're the consumers. And just like so much of medicine and surgery, we need to be staying current. We need to be offering patients the absolute latest technology that is safe and effective and is, is the best marriage between what we're trying to do and their bodies. And so to me, uh, it's really just uh, so logical to be going in this direction. If we look at the follow-up radiology of a second toe PIP joint fusion, here's a preoperative again. These are simple, straightforward cases, which is really nice. But this was the first in human use and and it's nice that this could be demonstrated on something as common and as routine and so necessary as digital surgery. 12 weeks after surgery, here you can see excellent approximation, alignment, consolidation with the implant here for a PIP fusion here at 20 weeks. A com complete fusion, you still see the implant naturally here, okay, because it doesn't go away completely until 104 weeks in the animal studies. 
Here you can say, see beautiful healing all the way around the implant on a CT scan at 26 weeks after surgery. Here's a couple other samples just to share a few different pictures with you. Here's another one at 26 weeks. Here's another one completely fused with CT scanning at 26 weeks. Here's another one as well. And so if we look at the present and the future use of osteofiber in clinical practice, well, clearly today, October 2019, the immediate indication is for hammer toe PIP joint fusion. Okay, second, third, or fourth toe, the 2.9 uh, millimeter diameter straight absorb uh, biointegrative implant is available now. The other sizes will be available, uh, but that's what you have now. But in the future, and where we'll be applying these is into uh, nails, screws, bunion surgery. Uh, midfoot surgery, hind foot ankle surgery, compression screws are in the short term pipeline development for foot and ankle, suture anchors, osteotomy wedges. There's even some fascinating animal study uh, slides on plate fixation where we can see uh, with the in house technology of, of osteofiber, the implant, the, the plates made out of these materials, the 50 50 mixture, actually consolidating and integrating into the bone. So even on the surface of bone, as we go through the months and the first two years, actually osseo integrating into the bone. Trimmable fixation nails, compression screws for midfoot surgery, forefoot surgery as well, the same. So bunion surgery, first metatarsal osteotomies, Taylor bunion surgeries, joint fusions, first MTP fusion, lapidus type fusions, all of these are wonderful applications for this technology as we move forward. So osteofiber in conclusion is a platform that delivers a really highly attractive value proposition across many, many segments. In spite of what your specialty may be, maybe it's just distal extremity, maybe it's hand and wrist, maybe it's foot and ankle, maybe it's sports and trauma, maybe it's peds, which every parent in the world understands immediately that they don't want something long-term in their patient's foot, their child, I'm sorry, not their patient, their child's foot, um, again, going back to my comment about patients get this technology and, and this innovation intuitively and immediately. Reconstructive type procedures, spine type surgery, the applications I believe will be limitless as further implants are developed with this technology. And so I leave you with the fact that this is really transformative bone healing. I think we do have credit to Osseo and their Osseo fiber implant and their technology, this 50-50 mixture of bone mineral content with the poly-LD lactic acid mixture, um, allowing the perfect marriage or the, the, or the most harmonious blend between the actual implant and the bone we're trying to heal, be it a fracture, a fusion, or an osteotomy, so that over two years' time, as the bone is completely healed and remodels, the implant is integrating and going away. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention.